Now, welcome back. So today we have the second instalment of an ESRI report into the practices of inter-county teams and players today. This was jointly commissioned by the GEA and by the GPA. The full title of it is Safeguarding Amateur Athletes and Examination of Player Welfare Amongst Senior Inter-County Gaelic Players. And Professor Niall Moyna, immersed in GEA and education and good health generally, is well placed to give us some thoughts on the findings. Niall, I would say, first of all, I know you were involved in this committee commissioned by the GEA and the GPA. I would commend them, actually, because they have a duty of care and in commissioning something like this, they are living up to their duty of care, certainly in part. It's well researched. Any time we can get information over opinion in public debate, I think it's a good thing. And there's some really interesting stuff here. Yeah, I mean, I, I've sat on the Medical Scientific Committee now on a number of occasions over the last 15 years. And it's something that the GEA do take very seriously, player welfare, across both the club and at inter-county level, it has to be said. And I think this is very, very welcome because for too long it was anecdotal information and to have hard empirical data to base judgments on make, makes an enormous difference. Well, can I jump in there at that point then? I'll give you an example of some anecdotal evidence. So I would have thought that the inter-county salesperson was rife in the country, you know, give him a job, drive around, shake the farmer's hand, not in the wing, curse, just sales jobs generally. And interestingly, of GAA inter-county players, GAA players are underrepresented in that sector, 5% compared to 11% of the general population. So even that was quite striking. I would have thought there would have been a higher percentage in sales, but that's not the case. Where we do, by the way, see most of our GAA players by some distance is the education sector. 23% of inter-county players in this country are involved in education. But I, I think two things. I, I think there definitely is a change in demographics and in access to education. I mean, I was involved with Monaghan back in the 1980s when a number of our players were sales reps. And that was the common thing. You got them a job, you kept them at home. But access to education now has transformed that. And that 23% is probably representative of their age group who are attending. Why would it be any different with an inter-county player than anyone else? So th that wouldn't surprise me at all. Working in the education sector? It, oh, yeah, working within it, yeah. I mean, look at national school teachers over the years, the amount of people involved in the GEA who have been involved in national school and in secondary school as well. It's been pretty high. Mm. Um, and in fact, I would like to see more of our male uh, players being involved in national school because, uh, again, there's a high percentage of females. They're a highly educated bunch, actually. That was another interesting finding, I thought. 61% of the inter-county playing population have a university degree. That is in contrast to 35% of the general male population of the same age. Well, 6% of my first winning Sigerson team went on to do PhDs. That's so higher, than, higher than the general population. Yeah, even, so, and, and, and part of that is these guys are driven. They're highly motivated. And if you can, if you can pick the right course, the right career, mm. that doesn't surprise me at all. They bring the same thing to, their, to, their, to, their, to their, uh, their life outside of sport as they do to sport. There was a high percentage of players, and this didn't surprise me at all. This tallies with anecdotal evidence and what you might hear. There was a high percentage who picked a course which would allow them to play inter-county football or hurling. And interestingly, only 40% who've since gone on to play inter-county and continue with their job only 40% said they would pick the same career again. Now that is a, a tricky area for young players who may well say at 18, 19, my one aim in life is to play for my county and if that means becoming a teacher, for instance, then so be it. Now they're left with the legacy of that age 32. Although there's nothing wrong with being a teacher. <laughs> Once they want to be one. <laughs> yeah. Once they're not sitting there looking at the kids saying you are simply a means to an end for me yeah. and I don't want to be here. I, I, I think, again, going back and looking at that, the issue here is that many of these individuals, they're 18 years of age when they're picking a course in, in, in college. I would say 40% of people who pick a course in college, regardless of whether they play sport or not, question it after the first year, maybe even after the first month. Correct. So, so, that's, so yeah. we, we understand that. Yeah. I think a bigger issue, and that tried to be addressed with the changing of the underage age groups, was the time commitment required to play minor football and the impact that was having on the course of their choice. Mm. I know a former master student in DCU, he looked at both the North and the South, uh, John Downey from Derry, and he found, it's about eight or nine years ago, that playing second level football and hurling was having a tremendous negative impact on, the, on their opportunity or their, their ability to select the course of their choice in third level, and I think that's a bigger issue. Okay, I'd accept that totally. And there is an element here whereby a lot of these stats do apply to the general populace anyway. So I, I suspect you stop anyone in the street. Four in ten will say, of course I hate my job. Why the hell am I doing here? The time demands versus education point comes up. So this is part of the bigger picture as well. So uh, I take this with a pinch of salt. 80% of players reported difficulty balancing the demands of studying and playing their education course. 
sorry, 80% of players uh, reported difficulty balancing the demands of studying and playing during their education course. So I, I think 80% of us balance, struggle with balancing our lives anyway. The one I wanted to check with you. But if I go back on that one, yeah. we, we, in DCU we have an elite athletes program and we have an elite Gaelic football program. And that would be common. And, and, and this is why I believe this is the case. Yeah. The footballers have to hop in a car and maybe some of them drive three, miles to, three hours to Donegal and back. The, the athletes walk, run out the front door of the house and they go for a 40 minute run and they're back in their shower and the guys haven't even reached Donegal. I think that's the bigger issue. Yeah, that's a fair it's point. The traveling. Yeah, a lot of them talked about travel as well in this study. But in, of the uh, balancing your education with your time demands playing inter county football or hurling, 16%, 1 6% either dropped out of a course or had to repeat a year. How does 16% a dropout rate tally with the general population? That would be pretty, pretty similar. What? Pretty similar, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, you know, but again, I think the demands, and I, I saw it myself during my time with DCU, the demands, I mean, it's easy for players who live in the, in the greater Dublin area, you know, well, maybe not anymore with traffic, yeah. but, but for the most part, if you have to imagine driving to Donegal and doing that two nights a week mm. and getting back at two o'clock in the morning and then doing it again on a Thursday, that's pretty difficult. Horrific. I actually don't know how they do it. I mean, it seems almost impossible that they're getting back at two or three in the morning and going to school the next day. In terms, actually, of what they were asked, the, by far the biggest response from all the players surveyed was reduction in the length of the playing season, fewer time commitments, and, quote, the reintroduction of enjoyment into our games. Now, this was part of, this is part of a twofold study. So some of these stats and pieces of information came out last year. And at the time, the GA General, Director General Tom Ryan said some of those findings, like what I've just read out, are sobering. There were details in there you wouldn't be thrilled to read when it comes to the pressure imposed on players. You certainly want, wouldn't want it amplified over the next five or ten years. So here we have uh, the GA Director General very aware of this situation. Here you have an overwhelming response from intercounty players saying reduction in the length of the playing season, fewer time commitments. And the question is, what are we going to see over the next ten years? Because they're crying out for it. Yeah, I, I mean, I've been on my hobby horse about this for a number of years. This is a runaway train. And I think the GEA have to take some of the responsibility. There's no point in you know, Tom saying these things. The GEA, in all of its actions, it's semi-professional. With, with all of the, the media, with all of the financial support now, the demand on players for, for, for photo ops, that didn't happen 20, 30 years ago. So you can't have it both ways. I think that's the first thing. I think the second thing, someone needs to sit down and, and seriously ask, is there a need for all of the collective training sessions? I just think it is totally out of, uh, out of hand. You know, teams are back now training since November, you know, for a league. And it's just non-stop. These are amateur players. And I think it's unrealistic. My own view is we could have the same quality, we could have the same fitness level if we reduced our training by 40%. And focus on the game itself, the skills of the game, the tactics of the game. Most, unlike 30 years ago, most kids today in college or even out of college, they look after themselves. You don't see the guy putting on you know, three or four kilos or ten kilos over the course of the winter anymore. They're more in tune with their health. So I, I, I'm very concerned. I think there's, the, the, the season is too long and the demands on the players, I would actually believe that during the inter-county, up until say the provincial finals, no team should be allowed to, to train more than twice a week. After the provincial finals, three times a week. Mm. I mean, that's, that's, that should be more than adequate. And you, you wonder the quality of the sessions. Why do you have to mean, and I've been involved with teams, and you, you just say to yourself, why are we here tonight? It's because the, the, the team next door to us, they're doing the same, so, so we might as, might as well do the same. I think we have to look at that and focus more on the quality of the sessions rather than the quantity of the sessions. It's interesting you say that. Paul Joyce, now Galway manager, was on the show recently, and he was saying something very similar. He says, we don't need all these training sessions. And I was saying to him, are you, are you training now? This was about a month ago. And he said, no, like, for us to be at our peak in May, we don't need to train now. Certainly collectively and certainly with huge demands on the players. That's interesting you say quality wouldn't suffer because we absolutely want here sustainable amateurism, I think. And yet we need that married to the quest for excellence that a lot of players will have. They want to be the best they can be in this 10-year window that they have, very limited. The Kieran McGinnies of the world, they want to drive on. But you think we could reduce training collective training by up to 40% and quality wouldn't suffer. Without a doubt. I mean, the current generation of players have the education and with a little bit of organisation, a lot of the conditioning work, and it is done on their own, a lot of it, but we could even do more on their own. And I think that collective training should be about playing the game. Should, collective training should not be about getting fit for an amateur sport, mm. not in this day and age. And if we focused more on the tactics and the game itself, which does happen, obviously, during the summer months, uh, I, I, I would be much more in agreement with that. Yeah, well, we'll have to see where that happens because you described it as a one. You, you described it as a runaway train, which suggests it's not slowing down. And this is a decade long. This, this is, and it's getting worse.
Uh, I, I would be very, very concerned. And now with inter-county managers basically owning the players, and I mean, I've said for a number of years, we need to reverse that. I think the clubs should decide when they release their players. They're the people who develop these players. Mm. And it's just amazing to believe that during the, the, the best period of their life, they're not getting access to them. So I, I, I think there needs to be, and county board chairman have to take, take a, a, a more a, a leading role in this. I think we need to, to rebalance that and to give the clubs more of a say in when and where their players are released. And when you're seeing young players now, elite players at DCU, and you talk about the three hour treks in the car midweek, a couple of times a week, are managers not increasingly understanding of the travails of all that travel like we hear? I, I think, would have thought the Mayo players train in Dublin and all that kind of stuff, yeah. no? Without a doubt, I mean, the, the, that's improving. With, without a doubt, okay. uh, without a doubt, and obviously the facilities, the, the facilities out at um, uh, the National Centre, um, Abbottstown. Abbottstown, you know, but the pitches there and the avail The problem was getting access to pitches, you know, in the winter time. So that has been transformative, and I think yes, and I think you have a lot of young conditioning, uh, co or, or, or conditioning scientists going out now working with the teams, and they're they're sort of preaching the gospel. Mm -hmm but it'll be the next generation of managers, the current generation, who will really understand it. You know, there are some, there are some maybe managers, I would say there's three eras of managers, there's those from the 80s, 90s, the early 90s, then you have the, over, like the Pori Joyce's, and then you'll have the current generation, and I think they'll be totally transformative. Oh, well, that suggests there's a real cause for optimism then. I would sincerely hope so, that, but at the moment, it's out of control. I mean, Dublin are a classic example. I, I, I've said for a number of years that Dublin probably trained less hard than any other team, but they're the smartest. Mm. And I know Brian Cullen very well, and I, I would speak to Brian regularly about this. And I just, they did it. Now, to be fair, a lot of them do their own work, and they're, they're very gifted, talented footballers and athletes, so I, I get that as well. But th there's less of an emphasis on them. You know, they might do, they don't even play in the, in the O'Born Cup, you know, their, their, their first team. They're on holiday. Yeah, they're on holiday, they come back, and all of a sudden they're peaking at the right time of the year. Yeah. Now, that's... There isn't a one size fits all. Like you can't say that the same for Division Three and Four teams, and I'm very much aware of that. Yeah, and interestingly, actually, on that point, in ter in terms of responses about the treatment of players by county boards, certainly there was a distinct parallel with as you went down the divisions, the unhappiness with county boards increased actually when it came to meals after training and all that kind of thing. So uh, I'm just a touch confused. Then you're saying that it's it's getting better and I understand what you're saying about the next generation of uh, managers coming through taking maybe a more holistic approach. So where does the runaway train aspect it's, it's fit a slow this? burner. The problem is that some of the managers are all still old school. Okay. You know, I'm not going to get into names, but there, sure. there, there are certain managers who believe to this day still, unless a guy is on his knees and he's vomiting, the session wasn't hard enough. Okay. And, you know, whereas the modern coach or the modern conditioning scientist understands, no, it, you, know, you don't need that anymore. So we need to uh, uh, imbue the game with as many of those people as possible. And that's, and that's slowly but surely happening. Okay, okay. Interestingly, by the way, this is still going on. So drink, alcohol, uh, less than the population. So inter county players drink less than the population, as you might expect. But when they do drink, mm -hmm. it's binge drinking all the way. And this is just, I mean, again, you're talking about old school stuff. This is the drinking ban. This is, this is almost um, fetish, yeah, kind of fetish, fetishization. What is the word? Fetishization. Fetishization. Yes, of drink, excuse me, yeah. Whereby, you know, it's unhealthy and it's a, there's almost a, well, you can't go near it. So when they do get a pass to go and drink, it's like obligatory to cut loose. The notion of a drinking ban for players who just can't, if they want, have an occasional pint and not be afraid to be seen in the pub and word getting back to the manager. That day surely is coming to an end. Well, it, it sort of feeds back into what I said earlier. That, you know, a lot of the managers are still from that old school yeah. and the school that they were in was the school of heavy drinking. So their perception is that we can't give these guys, you know, the onus, you know, and, 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 and the, the, um, responsibility the, the, the responsibility and trust, and free, and trust uh, to drink. And I'd be, you know, again, you know, binge drinking, you know, that's a recipe for disaster as well. You know, I mean, there are, there'll be certain players who have a, predisposition to developing a dependency on alcohol and going out and binge drinking isn't exactly what they should be doing. It's been learning how to drink sociably mm. and that's certainly not the way to do that. The supplement culture came up. I'm really interested to get your take on this. So there's a few different points to make here. It would seem the vast majority of players up to around 80% are taking supplements on a regular basis. What are supplements first of all because there could be a danger people will conflate supplements with something illegal. 
Yeah, supplements is, is any extra food, vitamin, mineral, we call it the, the ergogenic aids that can enhance performance. Either can enhance, enhance recovery, enhance the performance itself, yeah. or have an anabolic effect where it's reducing the amount of muscle breakdown but maintaining your muscle mass. So it's, it's, a, it's a broad spectrum. And so, you, look, you're around elite players. Are we talking in the main here protein drinks? Is that the main thing they're taking? Yeah, I mean, when, we, when we use the word supplements, people immediately think, oh, something illegal there. But taking extra carbs in the evening, you know, that's that more than you would. That's a supplement. Mm. Taking a protein drink at night to maintain muscle mass. Um, creatine was obviously was in, was in, in the media for years. Caffeine, you know, as a stimulant during a game or, mm. or prior to a game. And then the other one, that obviously, then is the multivitamins. Um, th they would be the, the, the main categories. Where are we in creatine? There's no issues with creatine, or are there? Uh, not really. I think, I think the, there's a bigger focus now on muscle uh, and uh, on uh, protein and maintaining protein or mm. building protein. It used to be creating was the, the key or was felt to be the key mechanism to do that. But now with the technology to isolate, you know, the whey and, 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 and the other types of protein that can now can be sold commercially and very, very enhancing for, for building muscle mass and reducing the rate of protein breakdown at any stage in life. I was quite surprised to read that only 56% of those um, taking supplements said their usage was being monitored by their management team. I would have thought, you know, we hear so much about how hands-on management are and there's huge backroom staff. So basically, just under half are taking supplements which management have no real feel for or understanding of. And the headline figure is that 26% of players, this is the big one really, 26% of players are taking their supplements from the internet. And the ESRI have made the point that the potential of unintentionally using contaminated supplements is significant within the GEA because 26% of players, we're talking about a lot of players, are going for the internet, getting their supplements. And it was interesting, according to the Australian Sports Anti-Doping Agency in 2016, they said that anything as high as 19% of common supplements contain traces of anabolic agents or stimulants. And we did see an example of this down in Kerry in recent history. So you have 26% of all of these players who are taking supplements, taking them from the internet themselves. And then of those supplements from the internet, 19% can contain traces of anabolic agents or stimulants. The numbers there stack up pretty quickly. That's a lot of players putting themselves at serious risk and, well, one, damaging their own health, two, damaging their reputation for life. Um, that figure was the one that jumped out at me as well. It was pretty alarming. Um, we have a large backup team. There are large backup teams now supporting many of our intercounty teams, and I believe that no player should source a vitamin or any sort of these uh, um, performance-enhancing uh, sub substances from the internet yeah. without consulting either the nutritionist or the physician. And I, you know, in the report they talk about the, the S and C. We're, at, we're advocating that you know players take these supplements as well. I think that should not be done without consultation with nutritionists as well. And absolutely no supplement um, should be prescribed without a physician. Now we do look, look at the climate we live in. There's no reason why some people could have low iron, could have low vitamin D, and taken the multivitamin. There's no issue with that. Yeah. But it has to be sourced from you know, a reputable supplier. That's the issue. And the sad thing about it is now, you know, a, a, a player buys this, you know, with the best intention in the world, and if it turns out to be a positive test, his life is just turned upside down. And he's destroyed. He's a byword yeah, for yeah, cheating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, so I think it needs to be taken a lot more seriously. It's something that, that we talk a lot about at the Medical Scientific Welfare Committee with the GEA, is getting this information across. And I know, because if you sat anyone down who was ordering their protein, which promises great things off the internet, and you said there is a 19% chance this contains traces of anabolic agent, do you still want to take that protein? That's, that's the question. And well, the answer would be no, of course. <laughs> yeah. So that information clearly hasn't reached the ears of a huge percentage, 26% of players well, taking supplements. Well, to be fair to the GPA, they are they're trying. Uh, they're trying very, very hard to educate the players. Mm. And I, I don't think that, I mean, if, if there are people doing it maliciously, it's less than 0.01%. It's such a small percentage of people. Most of them are doing it for the right reason, that they're trying to enhance their performance. So take away the 19%, uh, which are containing traces of anabolic agents, just the standard supplements that are rubber stamped and official and fine and uncontaminated, how beneficial are they? Again, th there isn't a hard and fast rule, 
my own view is, you know, if you're if you're training and you're and you're and you're commuting and you're having to drive home, it could be a two-hour drive, it could be a thirty-minute drive. You know, getting your carbs, we know that 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 we replenish our carbohydrates most effectively within two hours. So mm. th that, that that's we've known that for twenty years. The same with, with, with the protein, if you're going to take the protein supplements, to take it at the right time, whether it's after a training session or whether it's, whether it's uh, uh, prior to going to bed at night to maintain, to decrease the rate of protein breakdown. But that shouldn't be done by the individual player. That should be done in consultation with the physician, the conditioning scientist mm. and the nutritionist. None of this should be done. The player, unless the player has a background in medicine or in, or in sport performance, they should not be doing this without consulting the professional people on the backroom staff. Mm. Were you on the cusp there saying they're not that beneficial? Well, uh, I was just getting to that. I, uh, the, the, it depends what you mean by a supplement. Is taking extra carbohydrate after training, because that's the fuel that you actually use, sure. and, it, and, and if it's maximally replenished within two hours, well, you'd be a lunatic not to take yes. your carbs. So, so we know that. I think if it's prescribed, if it's well controlled, I don't think it should occur in an individual under the age of 18, though. Because all of these, you know, all the studies we do on supplements are all done in adults. There's no studies that are published, you know, on the efficacy of these in children and where, 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 or, or adolescents and whether their, their bodies are able to tolerate it. So I think you always, you, 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 you edge on the, on, on the side of, of safety. Yeah. And I think under those circumstances, I don't think anyone, any teenager should be taking uh, any of these performance enhancing, that perceived to be performance, like caffeine, um, creatine. Now, there's no reason... Why, why they should not take uh, extra carbohydrates or protein if it's well designed and coordinated by a nutritionist and a, and a physician. Mm. I would presume lots of teenagers are taking those. Supplements. Yeah, if you, I mean, if you're taking these multivitamins and all of these, you go into, you go into these, these stores, I mean, as I've said many times, you, you're, you're just, you're, you're, you're creating expensive urine because they're not having, you know, that great of, and most studies, if you look at most studies globally after the last 30 years, you know, if there was a magic bullet, we'd all be using it. And yeah. there is no magic supplement, you know, that's going to enhance your performance, that enormous 5 to 10% that people are going to see. It just doesn't happen. It's doing something regularly on a constant basis along with your training. With the, and it's not, when we look at carbohydrates and protein, we're not talking about supplements. We're talking about nutrition. That's optimal nutrition. Yeah. They're not supplements. And unfortunately, they, they use these terms in the report that they're supplements. They're not actually supplements. That's optimal nutrition. Okay. And we should make that, th 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 that very, very clear. Okay. Well, hopefully the message gets through about the 26% of players ordering their um, supplements off the internet and hoping for the best, because I think they would be shocked if they heard 19% potentially contaminated with anabolic agents. Do they... Uh, uh, you, well, you can't speak for an entire industry. Is there any suggestion or suspicion that anabolic agents find themselves in these, uh, stim uh, these um, supplements because they actually do make somebody feel a bit better and they feel a bit of a spike and they get a result and they think, oh, you know, this is, this is the placebo effect plus another little extra something which is against the rules. Is there any sense that that's potentially going on or is it just accidental contamination? I ask that because 19% contamination. I mean, if you buy a bit of food and it says may contain nuts, you know, your odds are low. Yeah. 19% is very careless. Yeah. I mean, there's people throwing stuff around the old factory there. What's going on? But, but again, if, you, if the player is taking it and feeling really good after taking it, the player doesn't know that it's contaminated. That's my point. He might yeah. think this stuff, is, this yeah, protein yeah, yeah. is yeah. Great. great. And in fact, that's why a lot of it is manufactured in China and the Far East. And it's purposely spiked to give them this anabolic effect. They think it's absolutely wonderful. Yes. And it's not because of the, of the compound on the label. It's the compound that's not on the label. That's my, that's, was, that's yeah. my point. Yeah. I, I would think 19% suggests that is uh, happening. It is, yeah. And that's why I, mean, we, I keep making this point. They need to be very, very careful. It yeah. just, t t and we've seen this with a number of GEA players. It just turns your life upside down. Yeah. And it's very hard to get your reputation back, even though you've done this you know, with, you know, with the best intention in the world. It's the apology on page 45 that no one sees the next right. day. So any other big takeaway from this survey? Does it suggest that the inter-county player is in general good health or are they suffering quite badly and kicking very hard beneath the water? Look, the key findings are not surprising. Um, I think for me, the major message from this is that we have to address the commitment that's required to play inter-county football. It's not sustainable for an amateur player. It's simply not sustainable. I was involved with the Pittsburgh Penguins hockey team and their Steelers football team. They didn't train like inter-county footballers. I mean, and they had recovery. They were professional athletes. 
and the whole idea when you train is you get the appropriate recovery to get the adaptive responses for training. You know, yeah. that, that's when you get the benefit from it. They just don't get that. There are two quick ways to fix that. One, the fixtures, which they're trying to do, and that's slow moving. And two, the power that the manager has. They're the two quickest ways, aren't they? Yeah. And you've mentioned both of them. And the manager, to me, seems as powerful as ever. But the manager has to report to a county board. Well, and I think county boards have abdicated their responsibility. County boards have abdicated their responsibility <laughs> in a host of fronts of late, as you can see. Yeah, but, but we need, I mean, we, we, I mean look, look what's happening in the FAI, you know, we, we need... Do county boards care or do county boards want success? They want success. Correct. You know, and it's instant gratification. It's not deferred gratification. It's instant. I'm in there for three years. I'm the chairman, you know. Now, I, that's not fair to say that to all chairmen. No, I There's know. some wonderful chairmen out there. But that's, that's the ethos that has prevailed for years. And that trend applies to a manager who knows he has maybe three, four years in the job, therefore we are training at 6 a.m. and therefore we are going to warm weather stuff and we are doing this and we are doing that and my three years will be over, I want to do as well as I can. I can't think about your hips in 10 years' time. And the next guy comes in and he presumes they've done nothing for the previous three years and they start the whole cycle. Yeah. There's no transfer between management teams. I mean, that all has to change. And is that not, that's not happening? That's well, I think sense. county boards now are beginning to... to at the first GEA conference in 2006, uh, one of the recommendations recommendations I made was that every single county board should have a sports science officer and that person would work with all the teams and they would decide what the training would be. That's so a, if, if a management a team idea. was taking yeah. in, they would decide, look, here's where they are on their journey, here's their training age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So 2006. 2006. Where are we now? Any sign? Is there any? Well, there is signs, there's no okay. doubt about it. I mean, there have been a number of them recently. I think Cork have recently appointed one, obviously Dublin have won, uh, Kerry have won as well, I think. So teams, now there's a cost involved. But I think the cost, this, this is the, for me, this is what has been very annoying over the years. The money that would be saved paying all of this backroom staff, mm -hmm. if you were a guy in situ all year who knew these kids from 12 years of age all the way up through their senior, and knew their story, knew their medical history, their training age, and that was the person that then links with each of the management teams that, that come in. Yes, makes total sense. Makes total sense. Like so much in the GA. <laughs> Uh, well, so we're getting there, is maybe your sense. Without a doubt, and I think, okay. uh, but again, it's still, we still can't lose sight of the fact that there is a fixture overload. You know, mm. these players come back, you know, after the winter county season, and then they've got to play a full season of, of club. And I just, and maybe that's the reason we're having the short, shortened careers. Well, there's no doubt, and we had an interview recently, a brilliant one with the yeah, I heard footballer. It. Yeah, and it was what, amazing. What, what more do you need? It's just uh, frightening, isn't it? And that's why we're checking out on the website. So I would think there are a few intercounty players listening tonight thinking, we could train 40% less. Why aren't we doing this? Oh, and get the same quality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Professor Nile thanks so much. Much appreciated. Thank you.